Hey guys, uh, welcome to the Atlantic Institute of Music. And uh, I think you know what we're here for. He's a little taller than me, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, a couple things. Uh, first, though, um, we've got uh, Port City amplifiers here and uh, really amazing stuff. Uh, you might want to check it out. And we've got Daniel Klein, is that right? Over here, who will uh, be glad to answer any questions about that. And of course, you see their Klein products up here. Um, and the guy that you're about to hear, I think you all know who this is, uh, he was here as a student um, <clears throat> just a few years ago, and he was an amazing student, and he was really focused on what he was going to do. Uh, that I remember about Tosin big time. And we've got, uh, got the results of those efforts to, uh, for you to be entertained entertain by uh, tonight, and please welcome Tosin.
thank you. Um, I don't know if there's any questions now. Um, does anyone have one? Yeah. Um, I can literally can't see anything. <laughs> it's, it's kind of. There you go. All right, you in the hoodie. Yeah. All right. Um, you have a strobe light. You. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was ready. Um, I want to know. I've I've watched interviews on YouTube all the time. I want to know how you go from Nirvana. You're always talking about Nirvana. How do you uh, go from Nirvana to that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's a lot in between the Nirvana and the that. Um, some of the in between was coming to AIM actually. Um, but uh, it's a natural progression. I mean, I was only aware of stuff on the radio and MTV, and that was a lot of Smashing Pumpkins and you know Soundgarden and, and Nirvana. So that's all I was thinking that you did on the guitar, unless you were playing blues or country or something, which I wasn't necessarily interested in. I had an older brother, and it was the, the whole hand-me-down effect of him being ahead of me, finding really cool stuff. He was a drummer, so he started getting Martin Drummer Festival DVDs. So I started seeing guys like, I don't know, uh, Tony Royster Jr. and like Virgil Donati and all these guys. And those dudes are always playing with you know pretty fantastic guitar players, so I started to get into progressive music that way. Um, Inve Malmsteen was the first guitarist I heard play on like an incredibly ridiculous, virtuosic sort of level. And I think the fact that it was neoclassical really made it click to me, because I was like, I could reference something like Bach or you know Mozart, but then it's like through a Marshall stack. So I thought it was super cool. So I became obsessed with um, trying to sound like that and started practicing a lot. So practice is part of a lot of the in-between as well. So yeah, that's kind of what I got going on, yeah. <laughs> I guess while I have the chance, I'll um, kind of explain what's going on with this guitar. Um, it's an eight-string guitar, and um, my approach to it is not that far removed from playing a normal six-string guitar tuned in standard. I am tuned in standard. Um, I have a E. I have a B string below E. The same way you have E and B here. And then what I've done is I've tuned my eighth string down to E. So I have uh, three E strings. And, you know, simple explanation would be like if I did a, a A major chord at the fifth fret or something. If I borrow below the root, I have a fifth. And if I borrow all the way down to the A string. So it actually really lends itself to um, bar chords. <laughs> actually, in playing positionally, you don't have to just do like a simple voice chord like that. You can do. Some of my compositions really kind of showcase this. Let's see. composition on the guitar, which I really like as well. So, yeah, that's the eight string guitar in a nutshell. Um, I'll do another
I'll do more questions if anyone, if anyone has any. If we can get the lights up as well. I see a Blackberry over there. You have a question? Yeah, I have a basis. Uh-huh. When you listen to it and uh, go to the right-hand cadence and stuff, I get that thing with the... Mm. Are you double-thumbing there? Yeah, it's love, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll go a little bit into that. Um, okay, um, I don't know if you heard his question, but he's referring to... Uh, I'm slapping on the guitar, but sometimes it's called thumping because um, instead of just using your thumb to get a single percussive hit, you can do a double stroke or a down and up stroke. So um, this technique definitely lends itself to a lot of unique, um, unique ideas. Um, so down and up. Like that, right? Um, you can begin to add digits to increase the amount of you know notes you can get per stroke. Um, it's, it's cool to add your left hand, so you can do a hammer-on and then, then do a double stroke and get a group of three, so it'd be like... That sort of thing, right? Then um, you can add your index finger, so now you can do a group of three on your right hand alone, so one, two, three. Um, you could add your left hand and in a group of three you can get a group of four. Like that. Um, then we can go back to the right hand and add another finger. So now I can do a group of four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. seven by doing a group of four and then a group of three. So um that's pretty cool because every time your thumb comes down you get an accented note and then all your other fingers have slightly different timbre so it's very like um as far as uh Articulation, there's a lot of different velocities because you're using different surfaces. So um, that's pretty cool. Let me see. Or you could do. So I'm going to do a group of five and then two groups. No, a group of four and then two groups of five, which gives me 14, which is a seven as well. But, um, So if you start doing um, triads and various stuff like that, you can increase uh, just the, the scope of this creatively. So let me see. Try it. 
pads and hammering on a section and thumping another section. And um, I don't know, it's very, it's very unique to, in my opinion. Wait, what'd you say? Oh, uh, yeah, it's like thumb. I don't think it's necessarily helping. It usually grosses people out. It's um, yeah, I don't know, like, I learned this stuff from watching Victor Wooten and people who have learned from Reggie Wooten and stuff like that, and they have all kinds of thumbs. <laughs> so, yeah. um, okay, so how about this? If you don't want to use your thumb at all, um, some of the same approach can yield some interesting results with a pick, so I can disperse how I'm producing the notes in a phrase by hammering on certain notes and picking other notes, right? So, like... A group of five, one, two, three, four, five, like that.
my life. A lot of questions. All right, uh, you and the right there. Uh, Yeah, metronome-based practice. So take anything, you can take a chromatic scale, but do it to a, a slow tempo, and then um, once you've like conquered that particular tempo, you can bump it up four BPM or eight BPM, um, and just use that as your approach to develop it, any developing any technique. Because um, it's all about like, as far as picking, it's all about synchronization between your left and your right hand, and there's no need to go about just trying to do it super fast if you haven't actually synchronized your hands. So don't be afraid to go slow. And uh, a metronome else because it's totally perfect time. So um, you can also mark your progress if you use a, a metronome. So start at the same tempo to warm up. You know, maybe in six months that warm up tempo increases. You know, but the, the whole idea is like you can you can kind of mark your progress and it's a systematic way of like you know thoroughly integrating or thoroughly, thoroughly developing muscle memory. So I would use this for any technique you're trying to work, even if you're playing classical music. And then when you go to perform the piece, you can. You play lyrically without the metronome, but if you want to develop, um, you know, accuracy and speed, it helps to use that, so, yeah. Anyone else? You got one? Yeah, how did you meet the guys in Greek Lunch, or like really old man, fashion, Samaria? Uh, okay, he's asking about uh, one of the first bands I was in, the first band that was signed. Um, Ash was in another band in the D.C., like Virginia area, and um, they sucked. <laughs> and then, um, but he was he was a, a promoter, so his band got all the good gigs because like he was booking a lot of this stuff. It was really annoying. And then he uh, he asked me to join the band, and I started writing all the music. And then we got signed, and you know, actually quit that band to come to school here. And he started a record label, and now we're all doing okay in our respective fields. So yeah, that's that story. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm a, I know you're trying to play a piano for me, and I was wondering, you talk about like what it was like for you here, and like how you practice regimen was like. When I was going to school here. Yeah. What my practice regimen was like. Yeah. Um, it evolved, but basically, <laughs> it was a lot of doing what I wanted to do um, at first, and then I realized the benefit of doing things I don't want to do. So I think it helps to. If you're going to sit down and practice, especially for multiple hours, divide it up. So, say you're going to sight read for 20 minutes, 20 painful minutes, and then you're going to, <laughs> then you're going to, I don't know, work on legato, and then you're going to work on improvising. You know, stuff like that helps to just um, cover a lot of ground. And if you do that consistently, you're developing so many techniques or you know, uh, concepts or whatever the case is. But it helps to just be a little bit organized. You'd be surprised if you know, just giving an hour to a particular, you know thing, a particular part of your playing um, on a daily basis can really do a good job of thoroughly developing it. So obviously if you're in school you have assignments, so at some point you should you know dedicate some time to that and whatever the concepts you guys are working on. But yeah, you know, give some time to yourself to be creative as well. So I usually would have my like creative time after I focused on a few things or you know randomly in between. But I always try to bring myself back to you know the point of like being focused, you know? Yeah, you got uh, you got a question? Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a, I have a question. Um, what are some tips or ways to um, for guitar students who are trying to learn theory, and how can they utilize that with different modes and different scales? Uh, what are some tips for guitarists to learn theory? For guitarists who are trying to learn theory. Oh, tips for them. Mm. For me, it was like. Okay, if I'm studying like, you know, a scale and it's like diatonic entirety, you know, I would try to maybe write chord progressions that use the chords within that key or take the arpeggios that I liked. Basically, I would turn everything into music, right? So um, that way you really like illuminate the whole point of studying a concept or music theories. You can, you know, I think here at school they do a good job of like giving you examples of where you find some of this harmony and some of this stuff. But it's helpful to um, 
try to compose with it. So say you're working with melodic minor, try to take some of the modes of it and write something that forces you to incorporate it into your playing. You'd be surprised. I think it really helps to ingrain it through your own way as opposed to learning someone else's song or simply looking at dots on a, on a grid, you know? Yeah, hope that helps. Good luck. Uh, you with the backwards hat. Okay, he's wondering about the um, effects thing I'm using. Um, is it better? Uh, I like it a lot. It's extremely versatile. Right now, I'm running it into a Port City Pearl and uh, I think what the uh, two twelve cap OS cap. Um, but it's a unit that you could run straight to the PA, and I think it sounds really good. I think it really shines when you, you play through a Port City Pearl and an OS cap. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but um, it's, it's great for direct recording, too, and it's highly uh, portable, so there's a lot of benefits beyond how it sounds. But, um, yeah, man, they're, they're kind of worth the hype. Yeah. Uh, one more question on this song. Um, I guess that's a good question. We rely on uh, technology a lot, so it's not like I'm like, hey, this is two measures of five four, and then there's a measure of seven, and then a measure of four four. And like, how are you supposed to? Certain phrases are kind of um, intuitive, even if they're odd meter, but some are a bit more linear and require memorization. It's not very conducive to jamming. So a lot of what I write um, ends up recorded to a click in the computer. And then usually there's obvious accents that the drummer will capitalize on. He begins to kind of construct his drum part, like a skeletal drum part there. And then um, sometimes we take that into the rehearsal space after everyone's a bit familiar with it. But yeah, everything kind of begins on the guitar and then um, goes to the computer. And that allows us to just have a very, I don't know, comprehensive view of like where we want to put things. It's like the notepad of the future, I guess. Sometimes I do stuff like this, like I have a phrase sampler, so like... Sequentially, you know, you can't just do a loop, so um, we kind of compose, hopefully that, that amount of music that I kind of had the seed for usually gives forth to other parts, and um, hopefully the song writes itself, you know? I find a good song kind of has a bit of momentum and you know what to do, man. but that's kind of how it, it all starts here, yeah. All right, I'll do another song.
Thanks. Uh, can we have the lights up again? You and the hat there. Uh, this is a band from Sweden called Meshuggah. What they do a lot is um, impose odd eighth meter bass phrases over quarter note pulses with a uh, like an even backbeat. So um, you get sort of a polymetric sound, and it displaces a lot of the accents, so they all occur one way in one measure, and then you know, a different a different point in another measure. So. They're an excellent source of a lot of this rhythmic phrasing, but I found that polyrhythms have been occurring in like other genres of music for like way longer than mellows existed. And this is kind of dumb that I didn't know this, but you know, Afro, Afro Cuban music, Malian music, um, you can hear it in a lot of sources. So it's cool to take the, the Meshuggah approach to it. Um, I think they do it pretty overtly and pretty consistently. So it's a good way to illuminate, like, you know, how to, how to, how to do it, because they're always doing it, you know? But, um, or you can listen to my band, because I'm always doing it now. So. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Or Google it. Google, uh, it's a lot of poly rhythms, yeah. Um, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, on the guitar in general, or while I was here? Uh, Most challenging part? I find like really having um, like in-depth knowledge of like polyphony on the guitar, especially in an improvisational context. So like just knowing as many chord voicings as possible, chordal voicings, like you know, just your ability to um, kind of improvise with more than one note at a time, and then how hip you actually sound. So stretching your concepts of what you know melodically you can do at what time, you know? Um, and just improvisation in general would be my weak point and something that I feel like I haven't gotten to where I want to be with it. So um, you can have all the technique in the world, but like in the moment, you know, can you throw out those licks and can you actually implement, uh, can you actually utilize that stuff in real time, you know? So I think a lot of my favorite guitarists and musicians in general have gotten to the point where they can execute anything they hear in their heads like like that. And I'm not quite there yet, but uh, working on it. So I would say that's the my con constant challenge, yeah. I wonder if you could describe how you developed your attacking technique. Three fingers, right hand. Oh, okay. Find my middle and okay. How you build He's wondering about tapping. Um, I find that if you have a particularly weak finger, you should like, Ignore all your strong fingers and focus on that weak finger. So make up a, an etude or like a, a lick or a phrase that forces you to use that sort of weaker finger because the whole idea is to incorporate it to get it up to speed with the, the other guys. But um, uh, tapping. Um, there's a lot of approaches outside of the whole Eddie Van Halen sort of like the whole thing, right? Um, one thing you can do is like. Hold a chord. So I'm like kind of holding a chord and, and tapping notes and pulling them off against that chord as it rings. So that sounds cool. Also, the whole, um, let me see for a second.
get a, get away from the, the, the really obvious way of just kind of doing hammer-ons and pull-offs, you know? And it also allows you to kind of sound like more than one guitar, which is nice. Um, there's another... So Victor Wooten or Stanley Jordan is a guy who only taps. So, you know, just kind of check out players who have explored this territory, and it, it definitely is helpful. I think it's um, a lot of it's pretty intuitive because you're literally, you're literally just poking your fretboard, you know? So, um, I don't know. The sky's the limit, really. But, uh, yeah, I just, I would say look at guys who are, like, in-depth with tapping. Um, one more question. Uh, what point in your experience with guitar selection, so how Okay, um, I was playing six string for a while. Obviously, I started off on a six string. And then um, I joined a metal band that was detuning their guitars to do a lot of their material. And they eventually got seven strings. So I started playing it with this band. And they were just kind of doing bar chords at a low register, which is well and good. But... Um, I started kind of riding with it, and I found it really cool to have this extra string. Especially when I did, I would play and drop D a lot on my six string, but I started doing that with a low B, and then there was new chord voicings and more range. But I was comfortable, you know, it just expanded my comfort zone. So I stayed on seven string for a while, and then um, I started going to school here and um, getting a little bit more familiar with the fretboard in general, which helps. Because no matter how many strings you have, you're aware of like where an octave is and where a third is and things like that. So um, I I got a luthier to build me an eight string, and um, the way I tune it really helps as far as like not being totally um, I don't know disoriented because you can still kind of think on it like a regular six string. It's still fairly similar. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about uh, His name is Jesse Hall, but uh, he. I don't know, he fell off the face of the earth, so I don't, I don't really know um, what he's up to. But there's tons of guys, and then you could, you could even get a Schecter. You only want to spend a few hundred bucks, you know, so, yeah. Uh, in the back there. All right, this might sound really stupid. What do you think of the term gent? Gent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know what gent is for all you non-metal heads? It's not it's not all right, all right. Apparently this is gent. Sound. And that's what I think of it. I don't know. I guess it's a legitimate genre because you can you can really I mean if you can you can take out like or if you can isolate three, four, five qualities in a genre of music and they're consistent in every artist who are, who is playing in that genre, then I feel like you can call it a genre. So gent to me is a genre because you can really isolate what makes something gent, you know? But I don't really prescribe to genres in general. I'm concerned with the ones I like, and then I'm concerned with making a new one if I can, or combining the ones that I like. So, yeah, Chen, by any other name, would sound as good. <laughs> All right, um, one last question in uh, a, a last song. So, um, does anyone have, way in the back there. Okay, hey, like, what's up? Song, songs like Somnarium and On Impulse, I know, I know it's like you uh, have a way with uh, chord progressions. I want wanted to know how like you structure them and uh, kind of how you execute it. And so okay, that's a good question. Right, the song on Impulse actually started off when I was working out of a book called Hybrid Picking, which is basically like playing finger style, but you hold your pick and you use your pinky to replace what would have been your index finger, right? So 
Um, and there were some lines in the in the book, so I started doing things uh, like.